All right, welcome everybody. Um, sorry, I'm all bundled up. It's a little chilly today. Um, <clears throat> uh, so today's plan, as I uh, mentioned yesterday, is to have a bunch of discussion. So I hope uh, people are prepared. Oh, no video? It's not coming through? I think it's broadcasting. Hmm? There, oh, you're getting video. Okay, okay. Not for you. Okay. Um, maybe it could be... Yeah, that's that's not a bad idea, Hudson. Let's see if that works. All right, so uh, today's plan is to do a bunch of discussion. Um, and I had two things lined up that we talked about yesterday as the plan. I hope people are prepared and, and have things ready to go. Um, like I was mentioning yesterday, uh, did did anyone does anyone have some things typed up ready to copy and paste? On there were kind of two things that we had. Uh, oh, awesome, cool, Vernadette. Um, we got two two sort of topics for discussion today that I wanted to hear from you about. One was about Wittgenstein. And so which passages from Wittgenstein you'd like to take a look at? Um, I thought we could do maybe a little bit more with Wittgenstein before moving on to morality. Um, so maybe there's some passages you want to ask about. I got a couple I, I'm, I might call an audible on if no one brings them up. Um, and we might do a little bit with that. But then the main, the main thing I wanted to spend tonight, and I'm going to try to do time management to make sure we got uh, space for, is to discuss this why be moral question. So I hope that you've got... Um, I, don't, I hope you've got some. I uh, done some thinking about it, and you got some things to say about uh, what your reasons are, your personal reasons for why you participate with moral thinking and allow moral considerations to influence your your decisions in life. Um, okay. Oh man, Christian, you're having trouble with the video too, huh? I didn't see issues uh, earlier today with my students. <clears throat> I'm sorry you're having some technical difficulties. Wow, huh? Faith, you too, huh? Okay, so that worked for you, Hudson. All right. All right. Well, well I'm gonna I'm um, kind of move move ahead here, and um, and hopefully rejoining it'll it'll work with the video. Is the audio still coming through at least? Okay, that's good. That's good. Oh, it's working. Awesome. Wonderful. All right, so those are those are our two agenda items for today's class. Um, and let, let's start with the Wittgenstein stuff. So um, anything uh, awesome, it's working for everybody. Great, great, good to hear. Um, what stuff from Wittgenstein are you interested in hearing about or discussing? Anything grab your attention? Today's all about you, so I hope I hope people jump in. <laughs> the language games part, yeah. Okay, so if Wittgenstein, if Wittgenstein's general theory here is that the meaning that language has is determined by how it's used, then to figure out what's going on with language, we have to think about the role that it plays in behavior. And so behavioral interactions that have parameters that involve language are going to be called language games. And, and Wittgenstein actually, um, he initially calls language games just the sorts of activities that uh, we engage in that train competency with language, but we could also describe, and, and many Wittgensteinians have since Wittgenstein, since he wrote the philosophical investigations, just use language games to refer to those activities that we engage in that have a linguistic component. Um, baseball is a great example. Um, 
So uh, baseball has all sorts of things going on in that, and it's also a literal game, right? So that's kind of fun too here. Um, but baseball has a whole lot of things going on in the game that are not, we wouldn't call linguistic activities, like hitting a baseball or catching a baseball or throwing a baseball, running around the bases. Those are not linguistic acts. They don't have linguistic significance. But things like the... You know, all those signs that are used, the code signs that are used, um, or the umpire yelling, you're out, and then like doing this thing, those are all ling linguistic actions. They are, and the significance that they have depends on what role they play in playing the game of baseball. So uh, I actually use this example when, I, when we do a little pseudo Wittgensteinian stuff in my critical thinking class um, when we're talking about language uh, that I've alluded to before. Um, I use the example of the umpire yelling you're out, maybe doing the, you know, this you know, sign or something. There, there was a really awesome old umpire who died a few years back who, went to, to call a strikeout, he would go, like this, a big gesture with his body. Um, so that was his linguistic activity um, for calling a batter out. And that's like the action. For the umpire to yell, you're out, like that, it makes a move in the game. It changes the state of play. When a fan in the stands yells, you're out, that doesn't have the same significance. It doesn't have, it doesn't affect the game in the same way. If the fan yells, you're out, no outs are assigned <laughs> to, the, to the batting team, the, the offensive team, the team that's on offense. Um, but when the umpire yells out those words, now the batter is in fact out, like that's the status that they are, and that affects what they're allowed to do in the game. So the parameters of those rules of language games, or, or just the games themselves, and how they treat the linguistic components is the, the sort of defining elements of the meaning of the language itself. The utterance itself gets its reality for Wittgenstein based on the role it plays in that activity. And this will go not just for baseball games, but for like when we're talking right now, or you're just having a casual conversation with someone, the rules might be hard to pin down, they might be pretty sophisticated or elaborate, um, but it's, it's, still, um, it's still determined by what it means for us to do this stuff. How does that affect our coordination of behavior with each other? Uh, a linguistic community is really a society. You know, some kind of system of cooperation between people and how they interact with each other. Um, Christian asks, is it because the umpire holds some kind of power? Well, purely conventionally, right? Just just depends on the rules of the game, whether that's going to be the case or not. Um, and pinning down what these rules of language games are is actually kind of a sticky issue for Wittgenstein. A whole lot of the later, later half of, of philosophical investigations is devoted to try to understand that and what gives them their reality. If it's not going to be something up in the head, like what sets it, that's a little tricky. Because you could imagine like having a, a list written down of all the rules of baseball, right? Um, but what if the what if the players don't follow those rules? Have they done something inadequate? Are they not playing baseball anymore? Or like, what's going on? Um, it can be a little tricky. But does that help, Bernadette, for what you're asking about language games? They're important because they're going to define what happens to the linguistic meaning on Wittgenstein's use theory of meaning. Instead of the conventions being these associative connections of sign symbols and what they signify, that's the Augustinian model. For Wittgenstein, it's going to be how does this linguistic behavior factor into a behavioral game, like the, the slab builder example. Right? The significance of yelling slab is about how that move affects the interaction of the behavior of the people involved. Is it kind of the same with the value of money? Um, I mean, yeah, in, certain, in the sense that money is conventional, um, but just because there are like conventional rules for behavior doesn't mean that it's something linguistic. So that that's the important thing. Like I was saying, there's all these rules for 
what happens in a baseball game that doesn't involve any linguistic activity. Other, other things that people want to talk about here with Wittgenstein. Hello? Anybody? Is language a learning game? Um, what do you mean by that, uh, Christian? Oh, well, you're typing. I, you know, I might, because uh, this is a part of the, why I thought the copy-paste method could kind of save so, us some time. Um, I think I'll be sort of pausing the video intermittently, just for those of you watching on YouTube later. Uh, while I'm, like, waiting for people to type things into the chat, I might pause it and then, like, pick it back up so you don't have all this, like, dead time in the video. Um, while I'm just kind of looking at me, like, waiting for the chat or something. So, uh, all right. So Christian says, as in... Words hold a specific meaning that, based on how they are used, affects our behavior. Um, so, um, hmm. I mean, what Wittgenstein is claiming is that it's our behavior that, uh, that determines what the meaning or significance of the linguistic activity is. So the meaning of language comes from what we're doing with it. Whether that goes the other way around, like, is what we're doing with language going to affect our behavior? Well, yeah. I mean, if it's a part of behavioral games, um, it's going to be like a move in the game. Like, when the umpire yells, you're out, well, then the batter needs to go and sit his ass down on the, on the bench, right? You know, he's out. He can't, he can't be up at the plate anymore. Um, and if he did anything else, that would be wrong, right? Like, it would be, that's not how you're playing the game. Like, that's not, this isn't supposed to be happening, right? Um so certainly, linguistic activity will affect behavior. Um, I mean, it's just another kind of stimulus that people respond to. I mean, that's definitely the case. Um, is it a learning game? <clears throat> I mean, language can be used to try to learn things, like maybe school this is an example. Right? Like I'm lecturing or talking and explaining things, and hopefully that... Uh, you know, I can give you instructions for how to do something, um, like say the writing guide that I sent out for the paper. I'm using language to help you learn about how to do an activity or maybe um, reading a rule book for a board game of like that. I'm going to be using language and be like, OK, now that I've read the rules, I know what to do. Right. So that could happen. Um, but this is these are the sorts of cases that. Uh, Wittgenstein needs to tell a little bit more complicated story about when he's like, remember, he's not denying the Augustinian model. It could be that the ideas that words make us think of is part of an activity, that like thinking is acting in some way, um, and that could influence other actions as well. So maybe if I've, I've been trained in an activity where I read words on a page and think up certain ideas, then I'm going to translate those ideas into action. Kind of like in my silly example of when I was at the door and the student's like, hey, can you get out of the way? And I'm like, I got the mental image, and then I know what behavior to act on with that. Or in the five red apples case, the way we would take the five red apples uh, piece of paper, you know, the inscription that says five red apples, I'll think of an image of five red apples and then make sure that's what 
the content of the basket when I'm at the grocery store looks like to make sure I complete that activity successfully. So, so thought could be a part of it, could be a part of the game, the activity game of behavior, um, and maybe language, even in the Augustinian sense, can play a role there. Wittgenstein just wants to say, like, that's not the whole kit and caboodle. That's not the whole story to tell about what's happening with language. Okay, other things from, from people in chat here. Um, other things from Wittgenstein that you'd like to discuss. Oh, here we go. Faith says, um, he talks a lot about how uh, languages are made up of orders and how it can be confusing if people from different places see an order as the same object but a different sense. Could I go over that? Yes. Um, our language is meant to be made up of orders and it is positive to have them that way. Um, well, one thing that Wittgenstein says is he says, um, don't be bothered by the fact that his slab example that that's a language, this primitive language that he's setting up as a thought experiment, contains only orders. He's like, it doesn't have to. There are way more other functions for what we do with language other than to give commands. Um, so there, there's a whole, yeah, just a host of other things. Like when I'm talking in these lectures, I'm not just, it's not like a series of commands that are happening. Um, but these could be like gestures that affect how we interact with one another. Just think about like interpersonal communication, like um, between friends, like saying, like I could be making a request, right, when I use language. I'm like trying to coordinate our activities together. Like it, it might not be a command for a behavior, but I could be like, hey, you want to go see a movie next week or something like that. Um, or where I'm, um, uh, I'm performing a function of, of being maybe sympathetic to you by how I express with words um, how I'm receiving what you're sharing with me or informing like these are these are things these are other functions that we do with language um, and they're designed to have like practical usefulness okay so uh, it isn't that languages are all made up of orders um, but this is just one function of what we do with language that, that's one thing that happens even if we're not commanding each other we can still be coordinating um, our actions in some some sort of way that we're part of some cooperative game like um, take things like uh, uh, conventions around speaking um, and how we talk with one another that are uh, maybe not we're not always thinking explicitly about this but are implicitly about reaffirming some kind of set of shared values or social conventions or expectations for behavior um, that we're like reinforcing certain identities um, that then people are supposed to be acting on. That also would be a, a part of this um, matrix of uh, speech acts, as, as some contemporary Wittgensteinians put it, of uh, this like use theory of language. Um, and so how about this part about if people from different places see an order as the same object but a different sense. So Wittgenstein was talking about, uh, there was this passage where he was trying to like deconstruct what's going on with the slab you know, utterance, and is it, remember he's saying, like, is this, like, shorthand for bring me a slab, or, you know, what, how are we supposed to understand it? This is in response to a way that the Augustinian or traditional person might try to explain what Wittgenstein is calling attention to with this use theory of meaning, that maybe um, when we just hear slab, it doesn't have all the grammatical sense, but we, it's sort of implied or something like that. Um, that is still representational, um, and Wittgenstein is sort of responding to that by saying, "Well, it depends on what your language is for. What do you want to? What kind of games do you want to play with the language? Do you want to play a game where your language is capable of expressing lots of different meanings? So, bring me a slab is different than bring me two slabs, or bring me a brown slab, or." Um, bring a slab in five minutes or something like that, right? If, if we wanted to have those opportunities for behavior um, as a part of the game we're playing with the builders, then we might want to design a language that permits for those sorts of variations. But if we don't, then language doesn't need to have it, and we don't need to project it into the meaning of what the slab people are saying. Um, one, one other way I can help with this about like communication and miscommunication under how Wittgenstein's thinking about things, 
if for Augustine, for the traditional model, linguistic competence is a matter of just understanding the associative relationships between signs and what they signify, for Wittgenstein, there is still going to be conventions that you have to be sort of trained or competent with in order to successfully communicate, but they're all conventions for behavior. So if two people are playing two different games, then even if they're using the same linguistic objects, um, like the same types of utterances and stuff like that, they're not going to have the same meaning. A really, really, really good example of this is studying um, a, a language that's not your first language, like a, like a foreign language class. Um, maybe you, you study the dictionary, all the grammar rules, you get all those conventions nailed down. Um, so, And then you're like, I'm going to go maybe travel to a country that's far away where people speak this language. It's not proximate to where you live. Um, or, or maybe you just travel to a community that, that speaks that language as like their first language. Chances are the differences are not just going to be about the language conventions of sign signified associations. There's also going to be cultural differences. And that's why any good foreign language class worth its salt is going to train you not just in vocab and grammar rules, but also in understanding the culture of the people that are in that linguistic community that use that language. So um, I studied Japanese for five years, and then I went to Japan on an exchange program in high school and definitely confronted those kinds of things, that like I know how to represent certain images and ideas in Japanese, but I don't understand, or I didn't understand, all of the social conventions and expectations that attach to those as gestures. Like if I paint this picture with my words, what have I done in terms of a move in a game, in a behavioral game? I was ignorant to that stuff, and so there was some kind of misunderstandings that happened. Uh, it, well, the big, there was one big one that happened uh, with my host family in Japan, which was about doing the dishes. So I always, you know, I, I came from a culture, a family culture, where helping with the dishes is like a way of showing respect. Right? That's like, I appreciate... Uh, the people who helped make this meal happen kind of thing, right? So I wanted to help with the dishes. And uh, my host mother was like, no, you are not helping with the dishes. And it was kind of, it wasn't received as a gesture of respect. Um, her, her English wasn't good, so, and, and my Japanese was not very good either, even though I studied for many years on it. Um, <laughs> I'm not that great with languages, I'll, I admit to that. Um, but what we had to kind of sort out in, in understanding each other was not the language stuff. That was, there was a little bit of a barrier to, to getting to an understanding, but really the thing that we weren't on the same page about was what the rules for behavior were, for what those utterances and expressions meant as gestures, relational gestures. Is this making sense to people in the chat? And is, is this answering your question, Faith? Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, that, that basically, yeah, yeah. Cool, awesome. Gives a better picture of what's going on. Cool. In in their eyes, you were technically a guest. Yeah, that's part of it. Um, it's kind of like I, I'm refusing the opportunity for them to show me re sort of respect. Um, that was kind of part of it. Or that as if I uh, didn't think they were capable of it or something like that. Yeah. I mean, Faith, you were also sort of asking what struck me as somewhat of an ethical question. Let me know if I'm misinterpreting you. Um, but, like, is it good for things to work this way was something that you asked um, about, like, the, the sort of uh, commands or something. I, I think the, the answer here would be something like uh, there's nothing else that happens. <laughs> there's no alternative here. Um, when we are going to engage in communication with each other, it's always mediated by rules and conventions for behavior. 
um, for better or for worse, whether those conventions are, are like ethically proper or just or unideal and unjust, um, that we could have an ethical analysis of it. But it's not as though we could do anything different. Um, there's no way for us to interact with each other without some sort of commitments about what we're doing together. Um, or what the conventions are, what are the, what sets the context for how we understand relational gestures. Like imagine trying to show respect for someone, but having no set rules about what respect looks like. How are you going to do that? And there's going to be something. And you might try to go for like things that are not as uh, maybe conventional, like uh, the artificial things of associations that happen within a culture, but then you're kind of relying on some sort of natural expectations for these sorts of things that still would have to be picked up on <clears throat> for the other person to receive that what you did is a gesture of respect. So that would that would have to occur on some level. Even if the rules are one of, like, the, the, this is all permissible behavior. Do whatever. Do whatever you want. Well, that also is a system of conventions for behavior um, that people would have to be on the same page about for them to be, like, playing the same language game. Okay. Um, <clears throat> maybe um, there's a couple other really fun things. I, I'll, I'll share one little tidbit here before we leave Wittgenstein behind. It connects with something people were asking about. Uh, so remember when I was talking about the slab language and the variations, does slab, is it shorthand for some other kind of utterance that's got all the bells and whistles that we'd expect, the semantic and syntactic bells and whistles of an Augustinian conception of language? And Wittgenstein says, well, it depends on what you're trying to do with your language. Like what functions is that language designed to perform? And the Wittgenstein says the reason, one of the reasons why the Augustinian model is so intuitively compelling to us as a way of defining linguistic meaning is because in our language, there's a special game that we can play, that we've trained ourselves and each other in, which is to ask for the definition of a word. Word X is defined by Y, right? You got a dictionary that associates these things together. We play that game. We play the Augustinian game of associating symbols with something that they stand for. Our language is capable of that. We're able to do this activity of asking, oh, can you define that word for me? What do you mean by that word? And then you tell me something, and I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Now I know how to proceed in our conversation, because I can play that game. But does every language have to be able to perform that function in order to count as a language? Wittgenstein's like, no. Maybe the slab builder language doesn't have the, those conventions set up for behavior um, that allows to ask for definitions of things. And it can still be a functional language. You know, he's like, I'm not going to discount that. So the way in which he takes everything that is like uh, intellectual or about concepts and ideas and says those are actually all activities too. And if we want to try to define things theoretically, we're just playing another game. And that's where we get to the, one of the really big ideas from Wittgenstein, which is that most of philosophy is bullshit. <laughs> he says, when philosophers ask questions like, what is the essence of something? Like the kind of platonic question that where we started the quarter. Um, Wittgenstein says, philosophers are misusing language. They're taking the conventions and rules and parameters of the meaning of these words defined in how we ordinarily use them, and then importing them into what is a really weird and esoteric type of game, which is the game of doing philosophy. So when we're confused of like how to answer these questions of what are the essences of things or giving theories for these things, um, it makes sense that we're confused because we're putting them to purposes that they weren't designed for. And that it doesn't matter, really, what the essence of this thing is. For us to be able to play that game with it is not necessarily functional. We don't need to know what it is in order to be able to use it effectively and intelligently. That's a big idea from Wittgenstein. And it's, been, uh, it's prompted a whole lot of debate and discussion. 
I happen to think that Wittgenstein's actually wrong about this one, um, but it's interesting to kind of look at it through that lens of what are we doing when we're doing philosophy, and which we're always doing with a language. You know, when we're theorizing, we're doing something new. We're not just seeing things as they are, but we're playing a game with something else. The question, uh, the, 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 the thing I, I would mostly disagree I would mostly disagree about with Wittgenstein here is whether the theor theoretical activity is functional or not. For Wittgenstein, he's like, yeah, who cares <laughs> on many of these things. He thinks sometimes theory is helpful. Mostly, N Wittgenstein has the idea here, I can turn my hat back, that the usefulness of philosophical theorizing is negative to basically convince us that we don't have to worry about this, right? That we don't need to create a theory of it. Um, but I, I would argue no, actually, I think the theorizing is extremely helpful um, because it helps us to integrate other games, even if I'm just taking all Wittgenstein's assumptions for granted here, like granting them for the sake of argument, that to do the theoretical project is involving a kind of synthesis of games that otherwise don't know how to talk to each other. And is that making a new game? Oh, yeah, sure. But maybe it's a useful game. To be able to like coordinate those things together. If they, if these two different language games or uh, systems of how we coordinate our behaviors with each other aren't uh, able to kind of interface or talk to each other, um, then that's a, a function that they lack, and that's a function we might care about. And I think we do care about it. Um, I'm, I'm a Kantian on this one. You know, uh, maybe from, maybe you recall from the Kant crash course, I was saying Kant that believes that. The core function of the mind, which is also kind of a functionalist thing like Wittgenstein, is to unify experience, to integrate experiences together. And I think being able to integrate our different behaviors with each other makes a whole heck of a lot of sense. So uh, sometimes sociologists talk about this a lot too, of how when you're analyzing a culture or creating a theory for it, that's something different than the culture itself. You're like doing your own culture thing. You're doing the sociology culture or the theorizing culture that you're importing or projecting onto that. Um, and I'm like, yeah, that's probably fair, but that doesn't mean it's not worth doing. It could be very useful to be able to find ways to communicate. Is that going to preserve the meaning perfectly? No, well, because you're playing a different game. It's got different rules, but it might have rules that integrate the other rules. So you've got like the the theorizing game is like a meta game that is capable of comparing and contrasting other games. It's going to be different, but it's functional. It does have a functional purpose to it. Um, okay, how is this going down? Any questions in chat? Am I making sense or is this getting super abstract <laughs> and, and unintelligible? Making sense? Cool. Okay. Awesome. When, when I can't see your faces, your wonderful faces, uh, and read them, <laughs> it's a lot harder for me to know whether I'm, I'm doing something functional or not with my linguistic activity. Okay. Um, I think it's about time we moved on to what I was calling, what I wanted to protect time for as the main course for today. Um, and I didn't see a lot of other things popping up in the chat about Wittgenstein. So, um, Wittgenstein's got so much cool stuff going on. There's so many cool passages in here. I'd love to unpack more, but doing one thing means not doing something else. So, so uh, let's um, let's get to this. Uh, let's start talking about morality. Um, so I asked everyone to um, prepare some answers to this question of uh, what are your reasons, um, or maybe if you don't, it, it, what are <laughs> yeah? Let me put it this way: What are your reasons for why you think it is? Why, or just why explaining why you use moral considerations to influence your decisions in life um, and why you might think it's justified to do so, why that's the right way to live, um, to, to be sensitive to moral matters. Or if you have a negative answer to that question, why don't you use uh, moral considerations in deciding how to live? Um, so love to hear from you here. Um, I want to hear from as many people as possible. Drop the stuff in the chat. I'll be repeating it over the video. Um, and, and let's just, I, I'm going to try to avoid some commentary here and just hear from people first. Um, so I'm not going to be doing as much of the banter thing here. I'll just kind of report for people on YouTube watching this later what I'm seeing down here in the chat. Okay, so Nathan says, if we didn't, then we would get ourselves and others hurt. So I, I'm assuming here, Nathan, that you mean 
if people aren't taking into consideration moral matters, more harm is done in the world. Yeah, okay. Other, other things. What do you think about when you're like, why, why should I live a moral life? A factor is because some of our laws are based on morals, uh, but you put based in scare quotes there, Michael, um, like it's illegal to kill people, you say. Um, so what, what exactly is the rationale here that you have in mind? And, and maybe what's going on with the scare quotes around based? So Michael's saying uh, some people may base their morals on what their laws are. Is this what you do? So your reason for being moral is because it's illegal to do otherwise? No, this isn't what you do. Okay. I, I mostly want to hear from what you think, not like analyzing it for other people. But what, do you, what are your reasons? What do you think is justified? Anish says, I think morality to some extent is intuitive. So are you saying that your your reason for living a moral life is because it seems right? Just you have intuitions that kind of propel you to do so. To some extent, yeah. Okay. Like trying to help others. Okay. Julia says, I think for me it definitely is structured off what my parents think. Okay, so that might be like a motivating reason but not necessarily a justifying reason. Like, I'm moral because I was raised to be moral, that kind of thing. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and like I was saying, for this discussion, I'm interested in kind of both things. I think both are worth thinking about and, and putting some attention on. Like, just what motivates us to be moral, which may or may not overlap with what are the reasons why we think it would be justified to live a moral life. And, and for, for this conversation, we're not presupposing what is moral, but just whether we should even be concerned about morality at all. Um, yeah, so Julia says, I'm not sure for a justifying reason, though. Yeah. Yeah, being, being just like, this is how I was raised, could just be bias, right? Yeah. What other, what other things are people in chat, um, what do you think about? What's going on with you? Okay, so Faith says, having the same morals brings some people together. There's grouping in cultures. So Faith, your reason for living a moral life is just so that there's some social conformity and that you can exist in community with others? We've got a couple other things here, too. Um, hmm, not always, but it, it has also brought about people in my life. But it's good to be diverse, of course. That's how someone grows. Um, so, so you're saying um, by living in community, by having shared morals, whatever they are, uh, that, that, that permits for community to happen, that has been the basis on which you've been able to have interactions and relationships with other people um, but you're saying if I'm if I'm reading between the lines here um, it's good to have relationships with people who don't share moral values with you and that, that that's a part of growth am I hearing you right Here, while, while Faith is typing about that, I'm going to pick up another thread. I'm sorry if this is a little confusing for everybody because, you know, chat's a little peppers around rather than in, when we're in person talking back and forth. Oh, uh, Faith says, yeah, you put it in a better sense, but <laughs> basically, okay, okay. Um, just want to make sure I'm hearing you right. Christian said um, his reason is 
because actions have consequences, and those might affect me and others. And that reminds me of the, uh, the point that you made, Nathan, to start us off here about uh, harm. Um, and, and maybe I will throw a little commentary on this one. Imagine someone who doesn't give a shit about morality. They're probably still going to recognize that, right? They're like, yeah, my actions have consequences. Yeah, my actions may cause harm. But if we're wondering, like, why should we be morally invested... Um, the amoral person is going to be like, yeah, I know it causes harm, but I don't care about that because I'm not caring about morality, right? Mm -hmm. That's presupposing that I would have moral concern and that harm is somehow morally relevant and that's why I should care about it. The question would be maybe how would you defend being concerned about harm or why would you be concerned about how your actions have consequences on others? Um, maybe you could be concerned about how they have an effect on yourself, uh, but that doesn't necessarily require any kind of moral regard for your decision making. And this is not, um, I'm not saying like you're completely barking up the wrong tree here or something with this approach, but it is sort of interesting how to make a defense of why be, why be moral, like how to justify being moral in a way that doesn't presuppose that morality is already important, right? So making a circular argument basically. That's kind of one of the tricky aspects to this question that we're considering. Bernadette says, sometimes I reject moral considerations. That's what you mean by them, I think. Sometimes I reject them because I'm curious of the outcome. It's not a good thing, but weighing the options of if the consequences of the actions I'm willing to, to take on. Sometimes it's good or bad, but mostly good. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm not sure I've got the full idea here, but I'll tell you what I'm hearing, and then you let me know if I got it right, Bernadette. Um, it sounds like you're saying... Sometimes you may not follow moral considerations as a way of just experimenting with life and seeing what happens. Maybe in order to rethink those moral assumptions to see if they really do have um, usefulness or whether they're accurate or something like that. Is that is that am I getting that right? Yeah, that seems about right. Okay. Um, this might also be um, r another one that sort of is done for the sake of morality. So if you might break certain moral rules to test them to see if they are the true moral rules, then it sounds like you're still motivated to act morally, right? It just might be indeterminate what morality is. So kind of the same way that you could be a true seeker and not know exactly what is true, um, you could be a moral seeker without knowing exactly what is moral. And your willingness to transgress some conventions of morality, like some ways in which people have encouraged this is what morality is about, in order to explore them critically to see if that's really what is moral, that would still be in service of morality. That would still be uh, a way of participating in life that is using morality as the thing that informs the choices that you're going to make. Uh, unless I'm misinterpreting you. Is that... Does that square with what you're what you were thinking? That that's definitely correct. That I've got you right. Cool. Okay. Okay. It might be worth clarifying here that when I'm asking this question, why be moral? We're not defining morality in terms of what a culture or society or even a person thinks is moral or what are the expectations for behavior like social conventions and things like that. We're thinking about what is actually right or what is actually good, um, not, not just what people think or believe it is. Um, kind of back to the whole realism relativism debate right um that what the reality is here is not reducible to just what people's beliefs about that reality are all about um i want to hear from some more people any anyone else here in chat want to throw in um what are or maybe people who have already shared if you've got some you might have multiple reasons or motivations for for acting morally um and maybe also some motivations or justifications for not treating moral matters as relevant for, for life decisions or for how you decide to behave or act. Okay, so we had a little break here with n no one answering, so I paused the video and I picked it back up again. In case everyone is wondering, the code word for today is spring training. Spring training. Um, I'm a big 
baseball fan. We're talking about baseball today, so let's do spring training because that's that's up and running. Spring training, that's right, Hudson. Yep. Um, so I, I'm not hearing from people. Um, I'm kind of I'm curious. Uh, would it be fair for me to assume that most people in the chat uh, think morality is important? Hudson says, yep. Uh, so does uh, Michael, Julius, Anish, Faith. Nathan says, absolutely. Christian says, yep. And the kind of follow-up is, do you think it's important, meaningful, um, but also, like, do you think it's, like, a super big deal? Do you think, like, morality really matters? Like, not just that it does matter, that it should inform our actions, but is it, like, a big deal? Do you think it's a big deal? Whether someone acts morally or not? Nathan says it really matters. Um, Michael says yes. Uh, Faith says the level of importance can also depend on how you're raised and your biases. Um, Faith, are you trying to basically psychoanalyze people that like whether they're going to care about morality or not depends on their background? But I'm curious what I, I'm asking a question of, do you think it ought to matter? Do you think it, that morality is a big deal? And if your upbringing means you you don't respect it, well, that's kind of tragic that you're you're doing something wrong. Like you really should respect it, even if you don't. Is that right? Faith says, I think it ought to matter. I was going back to the question you had about it, if it matters to us in the chat. Um, oh, so so you are, you're saying that for you, there's a conditional variable here on whether you would be concerned about someone's participation with morality that depending on whether they have a background one way or the other you're like yeah maybe for you morality doesn't matter but for you I think you really should be caring about morality is that what you're saying got some other ideas coming out here uh, Bernadette says if everyone was immoral then the world wouldn't function okay so now there's another attempt at justification that without morality we couldn't have a functional society or community of humans. Christian says it makes it easier to coexist um, if we have morality going on. Faith says, um, maybe I wasn't trying to be that deep. <laughs> Just going back to what someone said about biases earlier, I think. Um, Nathan says it would, but it would be shit. I, I'm not sure what the it is there, Nathan. Um, if the world was immoral, is that what you're talking about? Like when, yeah, following up on Bernadette's comment. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, so, I mean, if we think morality does matter, and we think it matters a lot, and not just a little bit, then it seems like there should be an answer to a question, why? Like, kind of kind of like when toddlers are like, why this? Why this? I, I tell my toddler, like, don't climb on the couch when, you're, when you've got food in your mouth. And he's like, why? I don't get it. You're making a big deal out of this, Dad. Like, why, why does it matter so much? If we basically say that to each other or to ourselves about, like, morality's a big deal, this is a big fucking deal, then presumably there should be some demonstration of, like, why does it matter so much? Why is it so significant? And now, now we're getting some answers. Uh, I mean, the whole question I was trying to get up with this discussion was about trying to get at that. I, I do, I, it's, mm, I don't know to put this. It's a little, I'm, I'm being a, I'm not super sneaky or something, but I just think that one aspect to this debate, this why be moral question, which incidentally is like the most preoccupying question to me as an ethicist. This is my area of specialization. And I'm like, th this matters a lot. My familiarity with this topic uh, reveals to me, or my, it's been my perception of de wrestling with this question so much that it actually is a lot harder to answer than we may initially think. That we sort of take for granted, of course. Right, of course morality matters but when it comes time to actually like specify it um, it gets a little tricky and I'm not trying to say something like there aren't good answers about this 
I definitely can report also from my experience wrestling with this question that I think there are some very good answers to this question that help to demonstrate how significant it is. But one of the other things I, I want to draw out here is that whatever question we have, whatever answer we give to the question why be moral will have a big impact on just what sort of value we're attributing to morality. So the last few answers that we got in the chat here were about basically the connection with, with social functioning. But do you think that the main reason why you personally and other people personally ought to be invested in morality is just for the sake of keeping this whole social engineering system running? Like, we should play by moral rules just so we can do our job being little cogs in the machine of society. Um, I'm kind of a little surprised if that's what you think, if that's all you think morality is about. Um, my guess is that that's probably not how you actually treat it in your life, if you do care about morality, that you, that you think that the significance of it is not just a matter of smooth functioning for society. And maybe I'll throw one little bee in your bonnet before we close for today. If the main mandate for morality was just to permit social functioning, just to have a stable system for society, for humanity, I think you, you might actually get a picture of the world like we have today, which is incredibly functional and deeply unjust, where there's tons of immorality that's going on, but it can be a really functional system. You can imagine very functional social systems that don't play by what we generally would consider, or when we get into like philosophical debates and ethical theory, about what is actually just, or what is actually compassionate, or what actually caring for each other or loving each other really means. Like All the stuff that we usually talk about as the substance of morality doesn't seem to necessarily be required in order to make society go, right? Even uh, deeply flawed cultures or um, or government or social systems that have massive injustice going on are incredibly functional or can be incredibly functional. Um, I think the history of colonialism is a good demonstration of this and, and our modern world too today that it has tons of injustices going on and that's kind of actually maybe why it works. And some people argue that trying to do something more idealistic is actually not functional, that it actually isn't practical to really live in a morally idealistic way. So that might be a clue that there's definitely something more to get into here, and that maybe the appeal to social harmony is not sufficient to justify why we would put this special importance on morality, and maybe about the specific things that we care about in morality too. Um, but there also might be a lead. There might be something about social relationship that does give a little bit better answer than just something like the smooth functioning of the gears on this aggregate level of societies. Nathan says, if there was a perfect kingdom, no one would want to live in it or rule it. Um, oh, uh, yeah, feel free. If you have to go, run. See ya, Hudson. Um, Nathan, I'm curious to hear more of what you mean by this. If there was a perfect kingdom, why would it be that no one would want to live in it? Or why would no one want to be involved with the administration of it, or investing in it, or something like that. You're welcome. There would be no goal. Why would... There, I'm, I'm sorry, what was that, Robert? Mm. Um, I, I don't. Are you saying that basically we need to have conflict? We need to be doing injustice with each other in order for life to be interesting. In order to have purpose in life. There, there are some people who have argued that. I, I've, I've heard people argue that before. Um, I, I think that's a pretty extreme view to take. Um. And I think in, in one sense, uh, now I'm just getting into kind of some of my, my two cents on the subject, but uh, yeah, uh, so Nathan's saying something similar here. Conflict brings purpose. If it was perfect, we would have to limit ourselves to a strict rule of morality. Um, so that might also, uh, Nathan, are you getting into something like um, if we have a perfect moral system, then that means people have less freedom? Is that part of it too? 
Okay. All right. So that's also the thing. All right. I'm gonna. I'm. I'm still recording the video. I'm gonna get a little couple comments in here about these. Uh, just share my thoughts on this. Do what you will with it. Um, I thought I'd put it out there in case you're interested. Um, there's a lot of debate to be had about this. Maybe we can pick up this a little bit more tomorrow too. But um, let's talk about the freedom thing and the conflict providing purpose. I'm gonna do. I'm gonna touch on both of these. In terms of conflict providing purpose, and that without conflict there wouldn't be any purpose. I'm a little. Um, I'm surprised to, I, 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 that kind of seems implausible to me. And here's why. Even when we're not killing each other or struggling against each other for survival or are pushing our dominant ideology or something like this, there's plenty of things for us to work on together that are things that provide purpose, like trying to understand the world, like doing science or exploring art or exploring what different types of experiences are possible, or what is a good life, what's a valuable life. Like, we could be solving the injustice issue and still have lots of questions about what is ultimately good. Um, true seeking in general, doing philosophy, like, we, we don't have to be at each other's throats in order to be doing philosophy together. Um, or, like, I mean, I love I love my board games. A lot of you have seen the... the uh, uh, videos I've been recording for people's outlines. I got my like wall of board games next to me. Um, I'm like, this sounds great. I would love to have a peaceful world. We can play board games. That's that's fun. There's purpose. Um, but play, play itself, I think, is underrated. Um, and there's plenty of meaning that can happen through cooperative activities that we do with each other and not just antagonistic ones. Um, and conflict doesn't require treating each other immorally either. Like board games can be competitive and there can be like conflict going on there, but it doesn't mean that we're not valuing each other. In fact, playing a competitive game with another person is actually a deeply cooperative activity. Um, as long as you're not, it's not like a, a game of chess to the death or something, you know? <laughs> so I, I, that, that's kind of my response on, on the conflict providing purpose thing. Uh, you know, I'm a big Star Trek fan, and Star Trek is the sort of premise of all this, the way back even in the first series, um, was that in the future, in the 23rd, 24th century, uh, all these sorts of things like war, poverty, disease, um, racism, sexism, all the prejudice, all these different things, humanity's kind of solved them. It's a, it's a sort of utopia. And there's still plenty of things for us to do and wonder about and work on and provide purpose. Um, so I, I'm like, yeah, that seems plausible to me. On the other side of it, about the freedom thing, um, I've heard this argument um, even more frequently than the conflict one. And here's just some food for thought on, on that subject. I think morality doesn't involve any restrictions on freedom. Not really. What morality presupposes is that you are free. That you have freedom to make choices. What morality is doing is making prescriptions to inform what you should do with your choice. It's not taking your choice away. It's presupposing it. This is why Kant in his moral theory thinks that you're not violating someone's autonomy when you give them an argument for why they should do something one way or the other. That when you give an argument, you're not shoving your beliefs down the other person's throat. You're actually appealing to their independent thought that they can think for themselves. They can consider all the reasons and arguments and logic and make an informed decision for themselves. They don't require you. All you're doing is just putting some stuff on their plate to think about. So morality is doing the same thing. To have prescriptions about how we ought to live doesn't in fact take away our freedom. It presupposes it. That's that's a little slogan I could offer for that. Um, morality is about what you do with freedom, not whether you have it or not. But if, if your relationship with morality, if you're thinking about it in terms of like, social expectations or rules that are given to you from some authority like your parents or the government or teachers or whoever, then you might have that kind of relationship with morality that it seems to be about taking away your freedom. Other people are not letting you do things, right? But I think morality is much more usefully couched or contextualized as just you to yourself. You're like, I could do anything I want right now. What should I do with that freedom? What should inform why I would do this thing rather than this other thing? And that's why I like this question, why be moral? It's like, why should you give a shit? Is morality something that you would want to authentically invest in, that you would choose? You'd be like, yeah, so I could, I could live my life by taking moral considerations into account, or I could just be amoral. I could just like 
do what I want and not worry about things like justice or compassion or what happens to others, just be selfish. Maybe I'll care about other people if I want to, but only if I want to, right? This kind of thing. Versus like, why would I think about saying like, oh, maybe I have an obligation for how I treat others. I, I owe something to them. Um, that it matters whether I choose to do this, treat should mistreat them or to benefit them or whatever, right? What would cause you to be putting stock in that, to find value or meaning in the moral treatment of others, to value them for their own sake, not as an extension of your value, but to value them because they matter, because they have value too. And you're just responding to that. You're acknowledging and respecting that fact. Why would you do that? What would be the basis for saying that people have value and that how you treat them matters? That's what this question also gets at. Some deep shit. Um, I hope this has been helpful and useful. Thanks for the people who stuck around here. Um, this video got a little longer because of that. Uh, but I'm going to, uh, since it's kind of not fair to keep the conversation going, with all these people left who had to leave. I think I'm going to hold off the video here. And then if you want to uh, talk more about this, we can do it tomorrow. You're welcome. Hope you all have a good day.